Welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. Since 1897, the Zionist Organization of America has been at the forefront of pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy for 120 years plus. ZOA promotes truth and facts through our influential Center for Law and Justice, our government relations advocacy in Congress, many ZOA campus coordinators, and reports and media articles. Several points about our, about our organization. We unequivocally support Israel's right as a secure and a sovereign Jewish state with Jerusalem as her undivided capital and with the right to defend herself if and whenever she deems necessary. Jews have the civil right to live safely anywhere they wish in the world, including Judea and Samaria. We have zero tolerance for terrorism against Jews and zero tolerance for bigotry against Jews. ZOA fully supports the withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal and all measures to stop that vicious genocidal regime to gain nuclear capabilities. ZOA is against terrorist funding of the Palestinian Authority and Israel has the historic and legal right to sovereignty, including Judea and Samaria. I am proud to introduce tonight's speaker. Kobe Eretz has served for 10 years as the executive director of ZOA's Michigan region, one of the oldest uh, regions in the ZOA. Kobe served in the IDF for three years as a sergeant and continues to do his annual reserve duty in Israel. He holds a degree in business and international relations from the Open University of Israel, a native Israeli, Kobe comes from a family of longtime Jewish activists and IDF veterans. He has a unique insight and understanding of Israeli society. I am proud to turn the webinar over to my good friend, Kobe Ayers. Thank you, Shell. Thank you, um, Alan and Natalie and uh, Eugene Greenstein for helping me develop this, uh, this program. Thank you everybody for showing up. We don't have a lot of time uh, and we have a lot of uh, material to cover. Uh, it's important for me to say that ZOA is a 501c3. We don't endorse any candidates uh, uh, in America or in Israel. Um, so it's, it's important for me to say this before we start. Okay, so let's uh, dive right into it. So we're gonna talk about Israel's UOD government. Um, in the past year, we had three elections in Israel. This is the first time in Israel's history where we had so many elections in such a uh, a short amount of time. So we will discuss how we got to this point and, uh, and what are we going to look at in the future? How, how, are we, how are this government is going to, um, to behave in the future. So um, we will discuss what roles the unity government will play uh, and the roles of the Supreme Court and the non-elected uh, players in Israel, such as the media and the NGOs. We will discuss uh, the sovereignty issue and Iran. All these issues are issues that the unity government uh, will, will handle and will go one by one. Okay, so how do we get here? So the two people uh, on the screen, uh, the one on the right, as you know, is Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, he's the head of the Likud party, the right wing um, party in Israel, the biggest party in Israel. Uh, he's, he is the longest um, pre serving prime minister um, in Israel's history, uh, longer than Ben Gurion. The person on the right is Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz is the head of Blue and White, and he represents the left side of the map in Israel. We'll talk about more about Benny Gantz later on, but let's see how we got here. So uh, last elections, the third elections, we see that the right uh, received 58 mandates and uh, the left, the Jewish left received 40 mandates and the Arab parties received 15 mandates. Now, what happened, what changed that now um, we are at a unity government? What, for the past, 50, for the past 10 years, uh, Netanyahu could form a government with no problem. This has changed. And the reason for this is because of this person on the right. Uh, his name is Avigdor Lieberman. And um, he is in control of seven seats of, um, in the Knesset in yellow. His party name is Israel Betenu, our home is Israel. And he 
he represents the Russian voice in Israel, the Russian secular voice in Israel. Now the question is, if he's been with Netanyahu so far for the past 10 years, what changed now that he doesn't want to form a coalition with Netanyahu? Because if you can see, 58 plus 7 uh, forms an easy coalition for, for, for the right. The reason for this is not ideology. The reason for this is uh, more an animosity between him and Netanyahu. That's, uh, I'm sad to say that this is the reason why we have uh, these three elections. This is the reason why we're going to a unity government. It's because Avigdor Lieberman doesn't like Netanyahu. And so this is where we are at, uh, at this stage. Now, what's the reason for, uh, for both sides to go to a unity government? So Netanyahu has a few reasons. One is applying sovereignty to Judea and Samaria. Netanyahu wants to be remembered in history as somebody who uh, applied sovereignty to Judea and Samaria. And, um, and he knows and he believes that we, we don't know who the president will be, uh, the American president will be um, coming November. And so Netanyahu knows that Trump is for this plan, is for uh, applying sovereignty. And um, so he wants, he wants it to happen before the elections um, in the United States. That's one. So he, he didn't want to go in other elections. He wanted to, he wanted to uh, apply sovereignty before uh, we have the elections in the US. The other reason is Iran. Um, Netanyahu is very passionate about Iran. He recognized Iran as a strategic um, threat to Israel. And he wants to make sure to do as much as he can to, uh, to lower the risk and the threat from Iran. Again, um, he, uh, he knows that uh, Trump uh, sees eye to eye with him about Iran, and this is why uh, he doesn't want to go to another election. The third reason, and no less uh, important than the other two, is the Supreme Court. Now, to remind you, Netanyahu has cases against him. Uh, the cases are going to court as we speak, and, um, but according to Israeli law, the Prime Minister of Israel, even if there is um, criminal charges against him, he can serve his term. There's a specific, there's a clear, clear law about it, and he can serve his term until he's found guilty. However, the Supreme Court in Israel, and we'll we will discuss uh, their role in a few minutes, um, they see uh, um, they see it differently. They say, you know what, um, there is a law, but the law is not as clear. Now, it's true that in the past week, the Supreme Court allowed this government to happen. But if you look at the fine print, the Supreme Court said that uh, they will leave the decision, the final decision, for later on, for later on in the in the term. Now, Gantz, why is Gantz going to unity government? Gantz uh, swore to his voters that he won't go with Netanyahu, uh, and the reason for this is simple: it's because he understands that this is his only chance to be prime minister. Gantz is one of the four leaders of Blue and White, his party, and he realized that the other leaders are not so happy with him, not so happy with his results. Um, and so he understands that it, it's now or never. So this is why he broke, he broke away from blue and white, cut it in half, and now he's joining Netanyahu. Now we're gonna discuss how this government is gonna look like because these two individuals and the two parties are very different from one another. Let's keep going. So a little bit about Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz is the head, was the head of the IDF. That's what he was known for. 2014, he was, um, he's the commander in chief when Israel attacked, when, is, when Israel was attacked by Gaza, it was to eliminate the, the, the terror tunnels from Gaza. Um, here's a little bit about him. So this is a direct quote of his. Uh, he said after the war with Hamas, he said, I am proud that I put IDF soldiers at risk to potentially avoid getting enemy civilians hurt. So basically what he did was, and, and soldiers did get hurt because of this, is Israel sometimes is too careful about um, and, and about the enemy and not enough about their soldiers, and that was part of his. That was his part of his what he believes in. That was part of his agenda, and um, you know, unfor and unfortunately, Israeli soldiers died because of that. The second thing to know about uh, Benny Gantz is that he supported the Iran nuclear deal. Now, to remind you, Netanyahu opposed the Iran nuclear deal. He saw it uh, as a very dangerous. Um, deal. Uh, so did ZOA, by the way. We fought it uh, tremendously. But uh, while Netanyahu went to Congress and, and fought it um, and fought and argued with Obama about this deal, Gantz um, supported the deal and actually came out publicly um, in support of this deal. Another thing to know is that Benny Gantz uh, tried to form a coalition with um, some of the Arab parties that uh, Part of their agenda is to destroy the, the Israel's Jewish state. 
Um, and we'll see how this hurt hit him, hurt him later on in the polls. So um, the, an interesting fact is that if you look at blue and white, and this is here in 32, they actually have 33, but if you look at their number here, uh, recent polls came up with the results that one fourth of their voters are actually in the center or on the right. Now the question is, how come if, if one fourth of them are right wing uh, voters, how come they vote for blue and white, which identifies as, as left wing party and not for Likud? So the answer to this question is the Israeli media. So the Israeli media, uh, first thing to say about the Israeli media is that uh, there's, there's no intellectual diversity. If, if in America you have CNN and you have Fox News, in Israel you only have um, the equivalent to CNN. You only have left-wing uh, media. There are not many channels there. Um, the Israeli media manipulates information and, and, and the way it presents it, just like um, um, CNN, for example, if you um, if there's a terrorist or attack in Israel, and CNN uh, reports the 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 the, um, the attack, what they would say is they they would say that a few Palestinians got hurt, and they wouldn't even mention the the um, the the Jewish people who got murdered. Israeli media is no is not so different from for, from that from CNN. Um, Another important thing to know about the Israeli media is that it doesn't just report news, but in many cases, it creates news. It puts, it puts what they care about in the middle, in the center. And this is what people see every day, usually 8 o'clock. This is the highest time of, of ratings in Israel. Um, and you get their agenda. To show you um, how important the role of the media is, this is a picture um, of four this is actually an ad that was done by Likud. Uh, this advertisement, you saw this, this ad everywhere in Israel, in the media, if you, if you on buses. And this was part of a campaign ad for Likud that said in Hebrew, they will not decide, the media will not decide. Because every day for the past how many years, many years since I was a kid, um, the media always bashed a certain side of the, of, of, uh, it, Israel's politics. Now, the dangerous thing here is that the Israeli media and the justice system in Israel have a very uh, close ties together and they, sh they share the same agenda. So a little bit of a history about, about Israel's uh, media. Until early 90s, um, Israel only had one channel, Channel One, it was a public channel. Um, and it was again, controlled by people from the Labor Party. Uh, in the 90s, there was another channel, Channel 2, and um, that was also uh, one-sided, uh, mostly got a left-wing agenda, and this is what people got, and this is what people were exposed to, um, and we'll talk about, I'll, and I'll show you more examples about how the media um, has their agenda. So, first example, Ariel Sharon. Uh, the, the person in, the, in, the, in this picture is Ariel Sharon. He was the Prime Minister of Israel in the early 2000s. Ariel Sharon was a hero in the Six Day War, and um, he actually has a lot of credit in establishing Jewish uh, cities in Judea and Samaria. Um, for that reason, the media in Israel, uh, the left in Israel, hated Ariel Sharon. Um, the media actually portrayed him in a very bad way. Um, there were also cases of um, uh, corruption against him, and the media just amplified it. So if you turn on the media in Israel, all, all you heard about was uh, Ariel Sharon's cases. You heard leaks from the investigation rooms, um, and it was a day-to-day -day basis. Ariel Sharon, um, unfortunately, um, had too much pressure on him, and he decided to fold. So he decided to do what the media wanted him to do, which is um, adopt their agenda. So Ariel Sharon decided to come up with a plan of disengagement from Gaza, as you remember. Um, the Israeli media, let me go back to this guy right here with the, the glasses on the right. His name is Amron Abamovich. And at the time of Riel Sharon, he said that, and he said it in, in, in a, in a, in a, out, out in the public, he said, we will take care of Ariel Sharon. We will give him good coverage and he will do what we want. He literally said that. You can look it up on YouTube. Ariel Sharon came up with the uh, plan to disengage, to expel Jews from Gush Katif. And unfortunately, this happened in 2005. This is a picture of Jewish 
uh, kids who were expelled from their home. Uh, side note, I was in the army at the time, Israeli army, and I was asked as well to come and, and, and um, take Jews out of their homes and, and destroy their homes. And I, I, re I requested from my officer not to do it, and he was uh, kind enough not to make me do this. But for, in order for this to happen, now I want, to, I want to put it in context. So if you look at Europe, uh, Jews were expelled from every, every country in Europe throughout the, in, in the last 2,000 years. To, to think that this will happen in a Jewish state is, um, is unfathomable. We, we couldn't believe that this, this would happen. Now, how did this happen? You first have to convince the public in Israel that this is okay and this is the right thing to do. So when you open the, the television, all you saw was experts uh, that said how important it is to, to, to clear this area, to give it to, to, to uh, the Palestinians and only peace will come out of this. So we know what happened afterwards. Um, here's another example. So this is a Jewish woman with her, with her baby. This baby was hurt by a rock that was thrown by a, a Palestinian, by Palestinians. This rock that you see um, on the car smashed the car. Now imagine, I want you to imagine being with your kids or with your grandkids in a car driving to school um, or driving to a, a to the mall, and all of a sudden, this huge rock is thrown at you. This is the reality of, uh, of, of Israelis in Judea and Samaria and other places in Israel. Um, this happens every day, tens of times a day. And believe it or not, the Israel media does not cover it. The only place you will see it is on social media, but the mainstream media, Israel media, is not going to show it. And this is important because this is how you shape the, the, the agenda. This soldier here, his name is Amit. Amit um, was murdered this week, and he was murdered uh, going looking for terrorists in a in a in Judea and Samaria. And he was struck by a boulder by a rock that was thrown uh, at him from a roof a rooftop. Now, again, usually the media the soldiers get stones thrown at them every day. You don't hear about it. Only when there are casualties, you hear about it. Now. In this case, the media c covered it because he, he was murdered, but this is how they covered it. They said that he was hurt by a rock, and they, in, instead of focusing on, on how evil the terrorists are, they said, well, he was thrown, uh, he, th this rock was thrown because Netanyahu is, is, wants to apply sovereignty. And so if you don't have a strong ideology, um, if you didn't grow up with a strong ideology, it's very easy to be impacted by the media. Um, another example, this is a graffiti that was done by Jewish kids um, after a terrorist attack, after a Palestinian terrorist attack. This was, this graffiti was uh, written on an Arab, uh, Arab home. And in Israel, this would open the news. This will be uh, the first thing that opens the news at eight o'clock. And so again, if you're not ideology, ideologically, um, uh, if you don't come from a strong ideological background, you would think that the Jewish people are the issue and Israel is the issue. Um, so, and it goes the same thing towards Netanyahu. Now, again, this is Netanyahu's cases uh, were amplified by the media. It was talked about every day for the past, since 2015. Um, and you only, you 90, 95% of the time you got their, their side of the, of, the, um, of the case. And again, this is not about Netanyahu. This is about what Netanyahu represents, and the media knows that. Let's keep going. So these two individuals here, the, the one on the uh, right is Reuven Rublin. Reuven Rublin is the president, the current president of Israel today. He was uh, a strong supporter of reforming the Supreme Court because he believed that the Supreme Court has too much power, um, uh, even more than the majority in Israel. Uh, he was appointed by Netanyahu in the early 2000s to be the minister of uh, uh, the Minister of Justice. Now, right after he was appointed to be Minister of Justice, there were cases against him. The cases were brought against him. He uh, he was he was acquitted. He the cases were dropped, but he lost the the opportunity to be per, uh, Minister of uh, Justice. Same thing goes to um, for Yaakov Neiman, who's on the left. Yaakov Neiman is a good friend of Netanyahu. Also, was appointed to be Justice Minister of Justice. Um, he also, once he got appointed, there were cases against him, 
In both cases, the media amplified it. There was nothing there and the cases were dropped. And this is a red alert. This is only two examples. If I had more time, I would bring you more examples. Alan Dershowitz talked about Netanyahu. The cases against him are unprecedented. Um, and, and again, um, this is not about Netanyahu. This is about what he represents. Now, the other side, this is Yair Lapid. Yair Lapid is the head of the, um, one of the heads of the opposition to Netanyahu. <clears throat> you see him here on a, on a newspaper, the leading newspaper in Israel, Yudot Echonot. Uh, Yair Lapid was paid, uh, his party paid money to, uh, to this paper uh, and he got good coverage. And this is what Netanyahu was accused of and there was never an investigation against him. Now the attorney general that brought uh, Netanyahu's case to court, his name is Avichai Mendelblit. Avichai Mendelblit, um, he um, met with over 80 journalists um, in, in just a matter of one year. And he was accused by the previous uh, attorney general of being, of being someone who is uh, unfit to be prosecutor. Now, when Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu's team um, said to Mendeley, listen, the media is getting leaks from the investigation room and, um, and, and this is not right. And so Mendeley said, well, you know, everything's fine here. The justice system is, is working just fine. Well, if you go back to 2015, again, this is the Attorney General today, in 2015, Mendenbleet and the uh, previous Attorney General in the picture, Mendenbleet said that the Attorney, attorney General is fabricating a again, uh, case against him to eliminate his promotion, and that there are leaks from the media uh, towards the, uh, uh, fr from the justice system. So you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the Attorney General himself, himself said this. So this is very important to know, uh, to show where we got to now. Now, what is the result of the, this, this bias uh, media coverage? This resulted in a tie, okay? So now we have a tie and it forced both sides to come to a unity government. Now, what would happen if we went to a fourth election? So according to the recent poll, um, we see a, a, a clear victory to Netanyahu, 64, mandates uh, for uh, the right versus 56. And the question is, <clears throat> how come Netanyahu, if Netanyahu knows this, how come he doesn't go, how, how come he is not going for another election? The reason for this is the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the Supreme Court in Israel is uh, the most, he knows that the Supreme Court, even if he wins uh, in a clear victory, the Supreme Court can say, listen, you have a case against you, and we're not gonna allow you to run as, as, uh, as prim to form a government. He knows that, and this is why he's going, he's not going for a fourth election at this point. Now the Supreme Court, why is it so important to talk about the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court in Israel is the most powerful among Western democracies. There is no um, other democracy with the same amount of um, power that the Su Supreme Court in Israel has. The Supreme Court in Israel is the only one that elects their own successors, okay? So I want you to imagine if you have a certain uh, um, kind of people in the Supreme Court, they elect their own, they elect their replicas. They bring their own people who think exactly like them. Uh, and they can cancel any law of the Knesset. And this is very important because even if you have 65 or 67 uh, mandates, which represent the vast majority of, of the people, people of Israel, the Supreme Court, 15 judges can just say, sorry, we, we, we hear you, but we, don't, we disagree and we won't, uh, we won't do what you want. It's important to also note that the Supreme Court uh, kept a secret log uh, up until a few years ago um, <clears throat> uh, for people, it tracked people on social media who just criticized the, the Supreme Court. Uh, this was your, your name, your data, everything was kept in a, secret, in a secret log up until a few years ago. Again, this is a red flag for, for democracies. Um, the people in the, in the picture here are two ex-Supreme um, uh, Court uh, judges, Aaron Barak and Michel Cheshin. I'll just uh, uh, shorten the, the quote. The quote says, uh, the Supreme Court is, is a family. We can't bring somebody else outside the family that is not part of it. Um, and this is what they think, this is what they believe, they say it out loud. And, and the result is that you get the same um, kind of people in the Supreme Court. Now, what does the, Supreme, the Israeli Supreme Court decides on? So uh, the Israeli Supreme Court decides on Israel's borders. 
Okay, so when, when the second Intifada happened, Israel wanted to uh, um, put a wall between us and the Palestinians to stop terrorism. The Israel already draw the borders. The Supreme Court said, sorry, you have to move the borders uh, and give the Palestinians more land. The, the, the Supreme Court decides who can enter the country, not the Knesset. The Knesset uh, passed a law that said BDS supporters and leaders can't get into Israel. The Supreme Court reversed it. And in fact, a few P BDS supporters did enter uh, uh, Israel. <clears throat> and also uh, there were uh, many African work, and work seekers who came. Uh, Israel said, sorry, sorry, this is the only Jewish state. We can't let you in. We want to keep it Jewish. The Supreme Court said, uh, no, you have to let them in and you have to uh, keep them there. Uh, the Supreme Court decides how Israel fights its wars. I'll show you an example in a second and can eliminate anyone from running for government, including Netanyahu. This is why Netanyahu is going to a, a unity government, not a <coughs> fourth election. Now, uh, these um, five beautiful souls that you see in the picture here, <coughs> this is the Hatuel family. The mother, by the way, was also pregnant at the time. This was the early 2000s. They lived in Gush Katif. Now, <clears throat> in Gush Katif, there was, um, in southern Israel, there were houses Palestinian, that belonged to Palestinians. And these houses were overlooking a, a major road in Israel where a lot of Jews um, and Israelis um, uh, used to, to drive by. The, the IDF saw that there's a risk there because you can snipe from this, the, the buildings, from, the, from those homes, uh, you can easily snipe uh, people who drive uh, in the car. Now, remind, to remind you, this time was, is a, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of terrorism in Israel, and uh, the IDF said, we have to destroy these homes. We'll pay the, the owners double the price of the value. We have to destroy these homes. So the state said, yeah, sure, go destroy it. But then the Supreme Court said, no, we, we, we don't care uh, what you say. You cannot destroy these homes. We're sorry. Um, the IDF again asked, please let us destroy these homes. This is very dangerous. The Supreme Court again said, no. What happened short after? From these homes, the, uh, this family uh, was driving the car with all these kids in the car. Palestinian terrorists shot from the home, killed all of them. Um, and, um, and this is what happened. And this is a direct example of how the Supreme Court um, has a direct impact on Israel's policy and, Israel, and, and every aspect in Israel, Israel's life. This is only one example. We don't have time for more examples. Now, the question is this. The Supreme Court does not, can, cannot actively decide on its own. It needs to have somebody petition to it. This is where the NGOs come. So the NGOs, there are a lot of uh, anti-Israel groups, Jewish and non-Jewish, that operate in Israel. The best example and the, um, the mother of all these organizations is the New Israel Fund. The New Israel Fund is, in my opinion, a, a strategic threat to Israel. They have literally billions of dollars uh, that they got from, the, uh, from many anti-Israel um, um, individuals like George Soros or the European Union. New Israel Fund distributed over just over the past 10 years, $80 million to anti-Israel groups who support BDS on the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. 16 of these uh, groups that, were, that are supported by the New Israel Fund uh, participated in the Goldstone Report and they actually, uh, they're the ones who um, blamed Israel for uh, war crimes in the Goldstone Report. The New Israel Fund provides millions of dollars to Moked, an organization in Israel, that um, represents, legally represents Palestinian terrorists, over 60 Palestinian terrorists who, who murdered uh, 80 Jews. Again, th this, this money, this millions of dollars is to represent terrorists, murderers. And another uh, thing on their agenda is to fight to open Israel's borders to illegal, uh, illegal immigration from, from Africa and from, from elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> The, how does this work? So the, the, there's a cl close tie between the New Israel Fund and other NGOs and the Supreme Court. The person you see in this picture is the president of New Israel Fund. Her name is Talia Sasson. And uh, she used to work in the Israeli justice system and a very high, uh, she had a very high position there. And so every anytime something comes up, the New Israel Fund or other organization just comes to the Supreme Court, petitions, and usually they get what they want. Uh, and usually they get what they want. 
Now, um, this is the background, how this government is going to look like. So what are the differences between the two? <clears throat> so um, the, the, the two represent completely opposite um, uh, point of views. Netanyahu and the Likud, the right in Israel, they want to apply sovereignty to Judea and Samaria. Um, and they want to do it, as I said before, as soon as possible. They only have a window of uh, um, six months. We don't know who the president in the, in, the, um, uh, in the U.S. will be in November, and he wants to make it happen in the next six months. On the other hand, Benny Gantz has a point of view of withdrawal. You know, we need to, we need to get out of the, ter we need to get out of the Judean and Samaria, and we need to uh, just separate between us and the Palestinians. Again, uh, to remind you this, they tried to do it in Gaza, and we, we got tunnel terrors uh, and rockets uh, in return. Now, why is it so important to apply sovereignty to Judea and Samaria? If you look here, uh, this is Judea and Samaria uh, within the, the uh, so-called Green Line. Um, this, these are mountains that overlook um, a lot of Israel, the center of Israel. Uh, if you look, there's only 15 kilometers from uh, Judea and Samaria until you get to you you, you get to the beach. Um, this this strip of land a is is very high, um, so it's essential that Israel um, has it in its in its um, position. B, this is the Jewish homeland, um, and 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 C, this this strip of land also separates us from Iran. So we don't have time to, too much time to talk about that right now. So we'll keep going. Uh, Likud believes in peace through strength. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, his his view is that we're we're in a tough neighborhood. Israel's in a tough neighborhood. The only way for them to respect you is through strength. On the other hand, Benny Gantz believes that you achieve peace through uh, concessions. You you do you make concessions, and your enemies will follow through. Um, very very um, short time on the on the uh, economy. The Likud represents uh, a small government. Um, a small government uh, point of view, less taxes, uh, free market. Uh, Benny Gantz, on the other hand, represents a uh, big government and, and socialism. Now, it's very important right now uh, because, it, because of the coronavirus, Israel is no different from the U.S. Israel has a huge deficit, especially because of the three elections in, in, in less than one year that cost a lot, billions of dollars. Um, Israel is a very uh, rich state um, but the question is, who who gets these uh, resources? So uh, we'll see we'll see them battling at, out. Um, and um, so let's keep going. So and then the Supreme Court. So Netanyahu believes that, and Likud believes that the majority rules. This is democracy, and the majority rules, um, and then the majority should decide what happens. On the other hand, Benny Gantz believes, um, and his party believes that the the final uh, say. Uh, should be done by the uh, Supreme Court because they have the knowledge and they're more knowledgeable than anybody else. Now, so how are we going to bridge between these uh, these gaps? Gaps. So uh, there's going to be an, uh, an exchange. There's going to be a deal between them. Netanyahu will get the sovereignty. Uh, he uh, he made sure that um, he took the tell Gantz that there is no unity government without applying sovereignty to Judea and Samaria. Gantz uh, is opposed to this. Uh, and he hopes that the uh, the UN and the international community will 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 be against it. But ultimately, Netanyahu has the Knesset uh, on his side. He has a majority in the Knesset to apply sovereignty. The only question is when. So Netanyahu got this. On the other hand, uh, Benny Gantz got control of the uh, Justice uh, Ministry, and so somebody appointed by him will will lead the Justice uh, will be a Justice Minister. And this means that there will be no reform in the Supreme Court for the reasons that we said before. And again, uh, this is only a question about left and right. Um, and this is why it's so important that the majority, in my opinion, uh, decides and not state official. Um, okay, so let's keep going. So I just wanted to show you a picture of Ariel. This is Ariel. This is in the middle of Judea and Samaria. When you, when you think about Judea and Samaria, or when people say we hate, we hear we hate the term settlements uh, at ZOA. We believe that it serves the other uh, the Palestinian uh, narrative. 
Um, this is a city in Judea and Samaria, and there are half a million people in Judea and Samaria, and it's only right that they uh, receive equal rights to other uh, people in Israel. Again, people just like people like, like this uh, live in Judea and Samaria, and, um, and so hopefully it, this will happen in the next six, six months. ZOA has been pushing for this uh, for many years, even before this was uh, uh, talked about in, in the mainstream uh, circles. And um, yeah, so the net last uh, challenge that uh, that Netanyahu, the Yehudi government has is the Iran nuclear uh, program at this point. So uh, when we look at the Iran program, we look at two schools of thought here, uh, thoughts here. One is uh, that says, one is Netanyahu that says, you, 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 receive, you get peace through strength. The other one is, uh, as you can see, President Obama, uh, and he believed in the in concessions towards Iran. He believed that this will uh, make them uh, want to not um, pursue war. And this is where also ZOA came. Uh, ZOA, for years, has been opposing the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, we we went against the deal even when other Jewish organizations um, didn't want to go against the administration at the time. Um, but ZOA. Uh, even when things are not popular, even when uh, sometimes even the majority of Jews in America uh, think other, 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 otherwise, we believe in our, in our truth. And this is why it's so important to have ZOA um, um, as, a, as an organization in America. So the two schools of thought here, as you can see, uh, Neville Chamberlain on the left, he met with Hitler. He made a deal with him. He gave him parts of Europe and we ended up in World War II. This is what Netanyahu wanted to avoid. This is what ZOA wanted to avoid. And sure enough, after uh, the, uh, the nuclear deal came into fruition, Iran is, Iran's hostilities uh, have substantially increased. Um, and uh, $150 billion that they received from, from the Obama administration helped them uh, help their proxies like Hezbollah. So $150 billion that were received by the uh, Obama administration served Iran and gave them a boost uh, to, to uh, continue their hostilities. And now again, this is where ZOA comes and this is where, this is why I'm so proud of being a uh, part of ZOA. ZOA is really the only organization uh, that he, uh, opposed the Oslo Accords, uh, which against literally the only major organization in America that opposed the Oslo Accords that resulted in bus exploding in, Israel's, in Israel and, and over Almost 2,000 um, uh, Israelis murdered. Uh, BDS, uh, the ZOA fights BDS and anti-Semitism, not only when it comes to white supremacy, but in all forms, even when it comes against Israel. And I'm, I'm, sh I'm proud to, to say that even one of our students here at University of Michigan, his name is Jesse Arm, uh, nobody wanted to defend him. No other organization wanted to defend him um, when he was um, harassed uh, at the university for being pro-Israel, um, the only organization that helped him was, was ZOA. So I, I encourage all of you to, to support ZOA. You can go in the, into the national uh, website, zoa.org, or to the Michigan website, mizoa.org, and support us. Uh, especially at this time, uh, you know, the virus has hit a lot of people. We need all, your, all the help we can get. We're, we are your voice there, and sometimes we are your only voice there. And we hope that you, you support us and continue to support us in the future. Um, so again, the last challenge is Iran. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the Iranian flags here just shows you the Iran, Iran influence. Um, Iran is Sunni, Iran, I'm sorry, Iran is Shiite, and Iran wants to create a bridge um, all the way from Iraq through Syria until Israel. Uh, essentially, Essentially, they, they were su successful, and this is why Netanyahu is, is fighting this now, and his um, um, efforts, who, which have been um, come to fruition, is to kick Iran out of Syria. Um, again, we don't have much time to talk about it, but um, so to, to finish, there's a lot of uh, pessimism and a lot of uh, negativity, but I'm very uh, positive about the future, about Israel's future. Um, Israel is very rich, and Israel has the best people in the world. Uh, in my opinion, I'm Israeli, so I'm subjective. Uh, the, the Aliyah from the United States is going up. 
Um, and we, and God is on our side. That's the main thing. So hopefully I covered enough to, uh, to show you a clear picture of what Israel is going through, uh, the, the players that, that shape Israel's uh, uh, future. Um, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Alan Sikorsky, you want to ask your question? Okay, yes. okay. I, I see that. Yeah, go ahead. Kobe, it's an honor. I'm a former Michigander myself, now living in New York. Um, first of all, I've been a political activist for over 40 years, and this is the first time I have ever heard about the Israeli Supreme Court. I I'm stunned. Um, it's never reported here. We have political activists that fight for Israel in all different, uh, all different venues against the J Streets, the new Israel funds, but we've never heard anything about the Israeli Supreme Court. And to me, where did they get their power from? And I, in America, we have a constitution, so the Supreme Court supposedly supposed to interpret the constitution. What is the Israeli Supreme Court basing you know, their laws and rules on? <laughs> so great question. Uh, the the uh, short answer is that, um, A, again, the Israeli Supreme Court gets their power from whoever was there in the first place. And so the Labor Party, uh, a historical Labor Party at the time, Mapai, was in control of, of the state. Uh, they controlled the institutions and they appointed their own people to the Supreme Court. Now, until, um, until the early 90s, the Supreme Court in Israel has served its purpose in a classical way. Um, you know, you have to have checks and balances on the Knesset. There is no question about this. You have to have a Supreme Court that is strong. However, um, they decided, they saw that the majority is not on their side. And since uh, they elect their own people, again, uh, if you ask most people in Israel, they will tell you, uh, especially people on the right, they will tell you that the Supreme Court is biased. Um, and they get the power from electing their own people. What they're basing it on is, um, is their own thoughts, is their own moral agenda. I mean, there is clear law, for example, about the BDS, uh, um, not uh, leaders not uh, coming into Israel. There's a clear law about, um, there's a clear law about the prime minister being able, able to serve under criminal um, investigation. But um, they say, you know what, the media is on our side. So uh, I'll, I would say this, I will say this, the two things is the, they elect themselves, A, and B, it's the media. If the media was, wasn't on their side, they will be afraid to, 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 um, to interfere as much. For example, with Netanyahu, I can tell you, um, and, and this is not just for me, this is from left-wing um, media reporters, they said that the Supreme Court did not want to intervene in the coalition and say that Netanyahu can run because this will be uh, bad for them because in the next election, the fourth election, Netanyahu will win by a landslide, and then they will be reformed to the Justice um, Supreme Court. So this is where they get their power from. Okay, so let me see another question that I got here. Um, okay, so there was a question about, uh, the question from uh, Len Getz. Um, so Len is asking, uh, there is no, uh, in the uh, agreement between um, Benny Gantz and, and, and Netanyahu, there is no mention of, of sovereignty. This is a great question. Um, and the, the answer to that is, hopefully Netanyahu is, is going to, to follow what he said and apply sovereignty. But the main reason why he didn't want to put it in is because Benny Gantz uh, doesn't want it in because he doesn't want the media to go after him. And this is, this is the, the most simple answer. It's, it's just for the media. It's unfortunately in Israel, uh, the media runs the show. The media de de determines what's important, what's not. Thank God for social media. Thank God for Facebook. Because let me tell you, as a kid, um, you know, I saw my parents want, wanting to, and myself, uh, wanting to bash your head against the wall because your voice was not heard, only the other side. The reason why sovereignty is not mentioned is because Benny Gantz wants the media off his back, um, I, and hopefully this this is you know so hopefully this will happen. Okay, so let's see what other questions are here. 
Okay, so th there's a question about who can change the rules uh, for Supreme Court. So it's very, so the answer is the Knesset. The Knesset can change uh, the, how the Supreme Court acts. The, the Knesset can come up with a law that says the, that the Supreme Court, court cannot cancel and cannot override laws that were determined by the majority. Now, uh, why this ha hasn't happened yet, you know, um, the truth is that Netanyahu, Netanyahu could have done it in the past and he didn't, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, people in Likud um, said that if, if, Net if Netanyahu will win by a landslide, this will change. Okay, um, Alan, you'll tell me how much time I have, okay? So I think I have time for more. Uh, Keep going. Let's see here. Uh, okay. So, you know, so again, so Israel doesn't have a constitution. Um, and, and, and even if it did, I think that, that the Supreme Court at this time, and I'm not a lawyer, and I, I only took one, two classes in law, uh, but if you look at the, at the arguments that the Supreme Court made, makes sometimes, um, you, you will find no correlation uh, between their decision and the law. And I'll give you a, an example. The, um, it, when there were organizations that, that uh, uh, petitioned the, petitions the, the Supreme Court when the disengagement happened, okay? So 8,000 Jews were thrown out of their homes. The um, Supreme Court says that it's, they're big into human rights, right? So these organizations came and said, hey, this is against human rights. You can't just take out 8,000 people of Gush Katif and throw them out. The Supreme Court said, uh, this is not our decision. This is a state decision. I'm sorry. Yes, it, will, it hurts your rights, but I'm sorry. We're sorry. Now, at the same exact time, in a matter of months, okay, and this, is, this was very infuriating. It, there were uh, Palestinian terrorists who exploded themselves in buses in Israel. So I, I'm sure all of you remember, I was, I was a teenager at the time. You went to, I went to school in a bus. I was traveling in a bus. I didn't know if I would make it back home. And a lot of the times, uh, my parents had to leave work to pick me up because they were afraid I, to, that I would go on a bus. This happened during the second intifada in Israel. Thank God it's not like this in Israel right now. But these Palestinians exploded themselves, killed literally hundreds of people. And so there was a, the, the state, Israel, wanted to deter them from doing so. And the way to do so is to move them, right, from one place in Israel to another. So to move terrorists their, and their families from Judea and Samaria to Gaza. Okay, this is as simple as just to deter Palestinian terrorists. The Supreme Court said at the exact same time where they allowed Jews to be expelled, they said, sorry, this, is, this hurts their human rights, we don't allow it. Um, so, you know, this is an example, and, and it doesn't matter whether there will be constitution or not, the Supreme Court, as long as they have the power, they, they will use it. Um, okay, so, there's a question about, uh, let's see here. Kobe, let's take a question from a hand raise. Yeah. Fran Malkin, would you like to ask your question? How do you raise hands, by the way? There's no- Fran Malkin, could hands. you? <laughs> Fran um, Malkin, are you there? Yeah, oh, yeah. Eitan, go where it says participants and then. When you click on that, I'll show you. Please, everybody, stay mute unless you're asking a question. Fran Malkin. Okay. I, 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 am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please ask your question. Um, you know, Israel is surrounded by a billion Arabs, and most of them are their enemies. Why do does the media in Israel and so much of the population, um, why are they so anti-Israel? Uh, why are they trying to get rid of Netanyahu, who to me, the country's doing very well under Netanyahu. Why get rid of him? What is the psychology? What is the okay, so, so this is, Fran, this is a great question, um, really great question. And, and the answer to that is, 
Um, it, you know, you can, I can take a couple of hours to talk about this and I actually did uh, a lot of research. The short answer is this. First of all, to put things in context, if you look at the right and left in Israel, vast majority of right um, ring vo voters in Israel are, uh, are Jewish. So when it comes to the Jewish people in Israel, and again, Arab civilians, they have rights just as Jews. But if you look at the facts, is that most of the Jewish population in Israel votes right. Now, there are um, people in the media, there are people, you know, the question is, well, how come J Street is, is doing what it's doing? It's fighting against Israel. How come New Israel is fighting against, uh, against Israel? My, my shortest answer to this is that if, you, if you're not connected enough to your, to your Jewish heritage and Jewish values, um, and, so, and, you, and, you, and instead of you know, Judaism, you adapt, I would say, um, uh, progressive, uh, I would say pr progressive uh, views as, as you know, today, then you know, if you look at most progressive uh, organizations, they, are, they, are opposed, they, they oppose Israel. Um, so I think it's a lack of connection to Jewish heritage, and I think this is the this is the shortest answer I can I, I have. Um, but in yeah. Israel, but in Israel they are connected. Yeah, I mean, so I, so I, it's that's a it's, it's, it's a good question, but it's a misconception. It's a misconception. You know, if you look at hi Jewish history, you see Jews who who uh, who um, <laughs> went against Judaism when 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 the communism wasn't was around. Um, and, and they, they oppose their Judaism in, in, in Germany, some, some people and some people in other European countries, and they, they adopted any, every other ism besides of Judaism. And this is, unfortunately, this is the same case here. And Israel is no different, by the way. There are many Israelis who know less about Jewish heritage than, than American Jews. Probably we have time for two more questions. Helene Ellis, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I was wondering about the... Uh, people who you comprise the New Israel Fund, George Soros, and whether that those two and others are connected because of financial reasons with uh, the media, which is on the left, and other such things. Even the Supreme Court you mentioned, that's kind of scary. Yeah, so I mean, so I would say that, you know, I, I would say that the main connection between all these um, people is, um, it, well, first of all, once you have the same, same kind of people in the media and same kind of people in the Supreme Court and same kind of people in very, very powerful NGOs, then you, lo you lose a little bit of a check and balance. The media is supposed to be there to criticize the government, to criticize the Supreme Court, to, to monitor uh, what's going on, and to bring up to bring up um, um, stories, but unfortunately, they only bring one side of the story. the The main the main uh, thing that the NGOs want is to destroy Israel as a Jewish state. They, they want Israel to be uh, not Jewish, and that's that's the most that's the uh, the best answer I have. Um, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think that a New Israel Fund is just um, you know, I have, I have many uh, left-wing leaning uh, friends, left-wing friends who served with me in the army, but the, the difference between them and the difference between them and the New Israel Fund is that they still want Israel to be Jewish. They might believe in this two-state solution, um, which I don't, uh, it, they, they might, they might uh, believe in other things that I don't agree with, but there are certain red lines that we don't cross and there are certain people who do. And many, majority of Jewish Americans, and until recently Israelis, we didn't know that. All right, one, two more questions. Mike Goodman, ask your question, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, my question is this. Um, do you think that there is a real danger of an overland invasion of Israel from Iran? Uh, the reason I ask is because you mentioned that Samaria has strategic value in the event uh, of what I presume you're referring to as an, a military invasion from Iran. Thanks. So, um, so good question. So uh, right now, a direct attack from Iran, no. Um, Iran is going to use Hezbollah to, to do that, to infiltrate, infiltrate Israel. In fact, Hezbollah had this capability of infiltrating uh, the north up until uh, 2018, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken. Hezbollah had tunnels that were going through uh, Lebanon into Kiryat Shmona, into the north, 
their plan was, um, this was part of my presentation, I just don't have enough time. I have a picture of a huge tunnel where, which can fit motorcycles and small cars in it. Their plan was to bring hundreds of terrorists through these tunnels and take over cities in Northern Jerusalem. The, answer, the short answer to this question is, is no, there's not gonna be, that's not what they're counting on right now. But what they do want is to create a, um, a ring around, around Israel. And the next war with Israel will be, uh, will, will be not just against Hezbollah and Lebanon, this will be called the North War. And Iran will be able to cover with Hezbollah the entire of Israel. But thank God right now there's the, um, uh, just like the Soviet Union and then the US, uh, both are afraid of starting a war because both know that that's not gonna serve anybody. Uh, Hezbollah knows and Iran knows that if there's going to be a war, then Hezbollah will lose their their uh, control in Lebanon. Um, so yeah, so right now, right now the, the main mission is uh, is to not allow Hezbollah and Iran achieve uh, uh, smart missiles, um, and this is the main thing that Israel is concerned about right now. And the second thing that they are very concerned about is the nuclear deal, and this is something that again uh, unofficial. Uh, sources say that Netanyahu is trying to uh, to get the right kind of technology to, to fight the, the nuclear deal. Okay, so the last question we reserve for ZOA Michigan President Sheldon Freilich. And Sheldon, leave your microphone unmuted so you can close the program, please. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, Colby, do you want to uh, <clears throat> mention the strength of the Supreme Court and the NGOs that file suits is so, so pervasive? Uh, that uh, IDF units ha now have lawyers uh, involved in every operation to advise the commanders? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So, um, you know, if you look at 2014 and you look at the war against Hamas, Hamas is, is relatively a, a small organization. It's true that they had the tunnels at the time. They went, uh, they went under southern uh, Israel border, into southern Israel border. But uh, if you look at the war with, with Hamas in 2014, there were over 72 soldiers that were murdered in this war. Now, this number, I'm not a general, um, but this number should not have happened. The, the, the amount of people that died in this war should have not happened. The reason that it happened is because Israel is fighting uh, an impossible war. They, they are fighting like no other country. They put their soldiers at risk because the Supreme Court and, and, and others in Israel determined that Israel can fight only in a certain way. Uh, the Palestinians know this, uh, terrorists know this, and this is why they fight from uh, uh, among civilians. Um, and this is how uh, soldiers get hurt. Um, and so this is why Israel didn't win, uh, didn't win the last war against Hamas, because Israel's hands is tied behind its back. And this is why also, by the way, uh, when I was a soldier, um, and my friends also, we used to get rocks thrown at us. We used to get Molotov cocktail thrown at us. And even if it's a boulder that can kill you, just like killed the soldier that I showed you in the picture, you cannot retaliate. Because if you retaliate, you can go to jail. There is no uh, equivalent like this in the world. Um, if a soldier, so, soldier's life is at risk, then the soldier should take uh, matter into his own hands. In Israel, um, some people would say, it, would say it's like this, but the truth is, it's not. Um, yeah. So, uh, and just a, there was a qu another question that I saw if the, the um, Jordanian king will fall. So I don't know if he will fall, but if you look at the rest of the Arab countries, things change rapidly. And this is why it's so important to apply sovereignty to Israel because you can, you can if you don't apply sovereignty today and, and Jordan falls into uh, enemy hands, then, then, you then you lose this territory. And this is why the only only uh, people that can defend Israel is Israel itself. Kobe, um, oh, so I wanted to mention. I guess we were out of the uh, PowerPoint, but I wanted to mention. Uh, so again, to 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 finish, uh, what I said now is just a, a glimpse of what um, of what um, you know we fight for. We fight for Israel's sovereignty. We fight for uh, for for Jewish uh, students to be able to be able to 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 go around campus freely to, talk, to say that they're pro-Israel. We are fighting the Iran nuclear uh, program. We were part of uh, the um, talks about moving the embassy to Jerusalem and so and Ramat Golan and the applying sovereignty to Judea and Samaria. 
I ask all of you to, to please continue your support of ZOA. We represent you, we represent the Jewish people, and, um, and thank you. So after me, we have uh, an event with the um, embassy. I think that uh, you'll get a link sent to you by chat uh, from Natalie. And then um, next week, um, I guess, okay. So, and next week we have, and the week, coming weeks, we have many events uh, that ZOA is, is uh, hosting. I want you to check your emails, check social media, go on the ZOA website um, and, and, and stay, stay in touch. We really appreciate you and, and, and we know what you do for Israel. And we're in this together. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Colby. Fantastic presentation. Uh, so informative. And everybody, keep, keep supporting ZOA so we can keep supporting Israel.